find it difficult standing your truth, struggle with trusting yourself, or if you want to find out why you find it so hard to ask for what you want, then this episode is for you. Speaking up for the things that you want in a relationship can be scary to the point where you freeze. However, starting small and working your way through some of these simple exercises can mitigate the terror of big asks by building up your positive experiences, making requests and creating trust with your romantic partner. Knowing your attachment style can help you with your intimate relationships and increase your happiness, self-worth and self-esteem. Our special guest for this week is the beautiful Ricky Close. Ricky is a writer and content creator with a captivating authenticity and passion for attachment healing. Her mission is to help others heal their anxious attachment and create more secure relationships. She is the writer and content creator behind Anxious Hearts Guide, a community of 100,000 plus on Instagram. What started as a research project to help transform her relationships from rock bottom has blossomed into a community and collective global audience of over 170,000 anxious hearts. Her goal is to help others improve their relationships by writing about attachment healing in a manner that is easy to understand and implement. Ricky's involvement with the psych and self-help community online inspired her to write the book she would have needed years ago. Her book, The Anxious Hearts Guide, which has already sold thousands of copies in 13 plus countries, is an approachable, accessible and enlightening window into why we do the frustrating things that we do to chase love and how to rise above it. It's now time to tune into this one very inspirational human being. Enjoy. Well, today I'm super excited about our guests and we were just having a conversation about our age, but we have got the beautiful Ricky Close. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I was just uh, giving her a compliment on how young she looks and how wonderful she looks for the topic that we are going to unpack today. So before we do that, Ricky, I always love to ask our guests to share their story. So Ricky, tell us, what's your story and what inspired you to do what you do today? Yeah, thank you. Um, Well, uh, throughout my 20s and early 30s, I uh, was a designer and a marketer. Uh, I had a pretty normal looking life, I suppose. Um, I was married for 12 years and I had a son and I thought that everything was perfectly fine until one day I realized it wasn't. Um, When my marriage started to crumble, I really looked into, um, looked to psychology to try to help out and explain where some of the problems were coming from. Um, I've always loved psychology. It's just one path that I hadn't pursued then. Um, So I, I started buying books and I started listening to everything I could find online. I found all the experts Uh, who were talking about relationship issues, and I stumbled upon attachment theory. Um, It's kind of a hot topic right now, but uh, several years ago when I was looking into it, it was still kind of gaining some steam. Uh, When I found attachment theory, I even showed it to my husband at the time, and, and he said, that's it. That's exactly what our problem is. And even knowing that, we weren't we weren't able to overcome our issues. Um, and the beginning of a very painful, although amicable divorce was the catalyst for me really diving into um, what I discovered was my anxious attachment, uh, which was a full 50% of my divorce. I knew I didn't want anything like that to happen in the future. And so uh, from there, uh, I began looking up ways to overcome anxious attachment. Because uh, as you may have heard, it's not like a personality disorder. It's just a set of behaviors that we gain from a young age uh, that did serve us when we were children, but it doesn't in our adult relationships. Um, And they're very possible to overcome. Uh, Everyone wants to become secure in relationships. That's that's the goal. And uh, I, when I found 
information and tools that got me there, I had to share it with the world. Uh, I started an Instagram account uh, as a marketer just to share what I was finding that was helping me to feel happy and secure and and like relationships were fun. Um, and I thought nobody's going to pay attention to this, but they did. The account kind of took off. I collected all of my posts and my writings and my research into a little book. And um, I've been doing that ever since. And that's how you found me, I think, my my account and my book. And here I am to talk to the world about anxious attachment or anyone who will listen because I can't seem to stop talking about it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I, before we came on the show, and I think this is really important for all of us to understand, it is a behavior. It's not uh, yeah. something that you are born with that you can't uh, right. get rid of, right? It is something you can work with. The behavior is not the person. We always, always have to remember that behavior is not the person. Absolutely. And before we came on the show, we were talking about that. And this is my belief. I, I just, you know, and I might be wrong, so please correct me. I feel <laughs> like we all have had an experience of an anxious attachment don't whether it was younger or in a relationship or at the start of a relationship but I think we've all experienced it in some way shape or form what do you think sure relationships are kind of scary are they especially new relationships or potential relationships so anxious behavior within a relationship is a completely normal human experience yeah, and so then from uh, for our our tribe, I'd love to really unpack through your mm -hmm. research um, what have been some of your learnings with a, the, your your anxious attachment style. Yeah, um, well, I think maybe uh, the biggest takeaway for me has been that the nervous thoughts that I had, or um, the idea that partners were never getting as close to me as I wanted them to, um, learning that those things were symptoms of a problematic way of thinking rather than being reflective of reality was really helpful for me because I felt very I felt very trapped by all those thoughts and overwhelmed. Like, what am I going to do with all of this? Before I realized that um, I was kind of I was kind of stuck in a way of thinking and a way of looking at the relationship. It wasn't necessarily the best way of looking at it. Um, that helped. It helped me feel like there was a way out, like there's different ways to approach this. Um, and it also really helped me feel like kind of, this is a strange way to put it, but one, that I wasn't really the problem in that I wasn't unlovable, but two, that I was kind of the problem. It's like the way that I was looking at it was contributing to the issues and that I could could do things on my end to make it better, which was very powerful. I needed some power back then when I was feeling so powerless and hopeless about it all. So the the thing that gets me, and I, I've I've uh, done a little bit of research around this as well. And my partner and I, mm -hmm. um, I'm avoidance attachment. And you are oh really attachment? Yes. And so we we really I really unpacked that because it's it actually comes from me moving uh, from one place to another. So my parents did a lot of work ah. and always got looked after by uh, different people, and then moving around a lot that I got to know what it was like to look after me. And so yeah. I just didn't know how to accept help to this day. Yes. Right? And then mm -hmm. so of course then then you know then my partner's completely the opposite. So understanding mm -hmm. these styles like you said like once you uh, became aware that part of it is me but then part of it is this behavior yeah how do then we because it's how does that help us in our relationship because we yeah. both know well, our styles but it's an unconscious behavior so we're not always consciously totally. aware when it's playing out so what do we do yeah. And um, knowing about it is is not enough. You know, it, just knowing what the problem is doesn't give us steps for helping out with it. Um, I guess the most important thing to keep in mind is uh, whether it's a spectrum. Right. And as you said earlier, we all fall somewhere along along the line. And sometimes even I have some more avoidant behavior in a relationship. But if you identify where you tend to fall more often, for me, it's more anxious. And for you, it's more avoidant. Uh, we're looking at where people find their safety in a relationship. For an anxious attacher such as myself, uh, I tend to struggle with a little bit of a lack of trust in myself. So my safety tends to be in other people when they come close, when they tell me that they're feeling very close to me, when they initiate. 
uh, that feels safe and comforting to me. For you, more on the avoidant side of the spectrum, uh, you find your comfort and, and safety in independence because that's what you learned at a very young age. So for you, um, coming close to somebody else might be a little bit scary because you know, you know from your experiences when you were young that other people aren't always around. I'm the one that I can depend on the most. Um, so when we when we know that that's what the issue is, we know where our work is. For me, my work was in learning to trust myself, learning to depend on myself, learning to become my own best advocate so that when no one else was around, I knew that I could be safe. Uh, the avoidant work is a little bit tougher because you can't do it all on your own, um, but your work is then to learn to lean into closeness with somebody else. Find that you can ask for help and somebody can help and it actually feels kind of good and people don't always let you down. Um, it's just it's just so comforting to me to know that we can, when we identify this, we can see where our work is, and that gives us something to do. I'm kind of a go getter, so when I see something that I can that I can actually do to make my situation better, I I find that very comforting and helpful. I'm having a bit of a giggle to myself because I do. I'm very much um, I, I need my space, and the yeah. more that I need my space, the more anxious. Mm -hmm. My husband. Absolutely. Gets, right? So it's, really, it's kind of really, yeah. really dynamics. So, and the more mm -hmm. anxious he becomes, the more avoidant I become. So, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's and, a spiral. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what I mean for, for, for us, sometimes we, we, we're we conscious enough to go, here we go again. These are, this is these mm -hmm. attachments playing out. So, what yeah, are some good. steps for us to like, I mean, we sometimes have a bit of a laugh. Uh, mm -hmm. because and aware of it that the more of my stuff that I project the more that I'm projecting I need my space the, it's almost like he's picking up on my projection going you need me to lean in you need my yeah. help yeah <laughs> he's reading it completely wrong he's reading yes mm -hmm. and yeah. same vice versa um, and 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 for, and for me mm -hmm. when I go I need my space he thinks mm -hmm. then he's done something wrong or there's something wrong with me and then he'll go what's the matter or is there anything wrong sure. with it? And then I'm like, why do you keep asking me that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I hear it. I have the same conversations with my partner, even though we work on this all the time. It's So um, if you think about the um, the pursuer, what's, what am I looking for? The push-pull dynamic that's so tough with you guys. Um, your partner is pushing to get more and you're pulling away. Uh, the things that you can do is for both of you to turn around at the same time. And I know that's that's tough, but anything that you can do to lean into the closeness and make efforts to show him that you're there and you're available and anything that he can do to actually kind of pull away, but toward himself um, is going to make you feel more comfortable to step into that space. It's almost so, like uh the, the center, I've got, I've got a picture of the yin and yang, the center. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Coming in, whatever that center is, whether it's within or in the center of the Yes, exactly. For him, he needs to take a step back toward himself. He needs to focus on identifying his wants, finding his voice so that he can speak up about things that he needs, and finding a lot of comfort and love outside of the relationship as well, which is terrifying for anxious attachers to hear. Um, but on the other side of the coin, uh, your work would be in stepping close, especially when you feel like pulling away, which should be equally terrifying if we're doing it right. <laughs> it is. And, and easier mm -hmm. said than done. Absolutely. This is this is I've been working nonstop on this stuff for four years and I'm still messing up constantly. It, it's forever work for me, I think. And for most of us, it's not something that you just you know, 10 quick steps to lose your insecure attachment forever. It's, it's stuff you have to practice and work on and, and it's scary stuff sometimes. Mm -hmm. So how do we move into secure? You were talking about everybody, you know, wants to step in and feel secure in their relationship. And I can't yeah. say there are times, even for including avoidance, there are times mm -hmm. I feel secure and there's, there are times I don't feel secure. So I don't think it really yeah. matters what style you are. There's, there are times where you feel secure and safe, like you said, and we feel there's a sense mm -hmm. of safety and other times there's not. So what are some of those things that we could do to feel, it doesn't matter what style you are, but to feel secure? Mm -hmm. Well, um, 
It's funny. Uh, it's funny that you happen to be on the avoidance side. I was not expecting that. Most of the people who ask uh, ask for a podcast interview happen to be anxious. Uh, hence the reason they're following my page. So let me think really quick. Um, there's definitely work that overlaps for both sides, but most of what I look up has to do with anxious attachment. Our work is very different from the avoidance. So first, I think I'll speak to the anxious side. If you tend to be the one that's chasing your partner, um, if the sentence, no one can ever come as close as I need them to be, rings true for you, uh, your work to feel more secure is going to be a step back into yourself. And if that sounds confronting and terrifying too, that's work that you probably need to be doing. Um, you need to be taking yourself on solo dates. You need to be carving out time for your friends and family. You need to be paying attention to the urges that you get to contact your partner um, that you're not doing anything about yourself. Um, another wonderful thing that we can do is learn to find our voice. Uh, anxious attachers also tend to stuff our, our needs down feeling like it's too much. So learning to step into into our power and ask for the things that we want that can be very healing for us as well um let me see uh the, another really important thing for anxious attachers is to keep our relational work on our side of the street i don't know about your partner but us anxious attachers tend to be the ones who think that we need to fix the relationship because the relationship is such a safety net for us um any hole that we see we dive right in and try to sew up as soon as we can. And um, that's something that we also need to, we, we need to take us, learn to take a step back and say, I, I need to focus on my side of this and not be so focused on fixing my partner or saving them. Um, that's the anxious work. And that's certainly way easier said than done. Um, gosh, you could write in, I mean, I have written an entire book on the things that anxious attachers can do to fix, to fix, to move more towards secure. But um, yeah, the avoidant work is a little bit tougher. Uh, this might be a good spot for me to plug my good friend, the loving avoidant on Instagram. Uh, their account speaks to the avoidant perspective and what their work is. Uh, so that would be a much better source. But if I can think of some of the things I've seen there, um, let's see, learning to look at your relationship as a place of safety, even if it doesn't currently feel like that is helpful. Um, setting aside some of that hyper independence and asking for help first in small ways and then progressively larger can help you to exercise a little bit of healthy dependence in your relationship that can help make your partner feel very needed and, and more secure about things. Hmm, the avoidance side. Um, becoming aware of the times that you feel the urge to pull away and maybe trying to stop yourself or at least telling your partner, I'm feeling the need to get some space. It's it's too much for me to, to for me to ignore right now, but I'm gonna be back in an hour after I clear my head. Um, little things like that that aren't necessarily so little can really make big that. differences i love mm -hmm. that because it's creating boundaries it's saying this is how i'm feeling right now because i normally say i'm going in my man cave for about 30 <laughs> yeah. minutes and then i'll come out when i'll come out i'll be a different person mm -hmm. one thing i do talk about and it's one of those things that we talk about i'm really comfortable about standing in my truth and uh, oh. uh speaking my truth Whereas yeah. I find, and I'm not just speaking about my partners, I, other people I know that are anxious attachment style, they find yeah. it really hard to stand in their truth. Almost impossible. In the beginning, it was almost impossible. Yeah. Yeah. So what what drives that behavior? Is, is it because fear of what others may think or fear of um, being ridiculed what is the driver for the for, for yeah to um, to not standing their truth right um well uh at a at a very young age uh we learned that we learned that asking for things um maybe sometimes got us rejected uh we've been fed the message many times that we're asking for too much and sometimes that's born of truth because sometimes we are kind of asking for too much. 
so we, we come to believe that the things that we want and feel and need are something that will destabilize the relationship. And it's just safer to not rock the boat and defer to the other person. Um, we're oftentimes worried that if someone sees who we really are and what we really want, that will spell disaster for the relationship. So we're kind of chameleons in that way, um, tending to be whatever our partner thinks would be the most appealing, which makes me really sad to say, um, cause that's absolutely who I was before I started all of this. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, there's a lack of safety in showing up genuinely and asking for things that we want as, as insecure attachers. I mean, avoidance can feel that fear too, for sure. Yeah. And so a lot of this behavioral conditioning is uh, things that we experienced from our, I guess, development years, right? So obviously my yes. story with what I was saying, we were moving around all the time. So I was able and looked after my brother and sister. So I had to mm -hmm. grow up really quickly. Um, so, but with anxious attachment, what other things, I mean, you talked about like, obviously when you were younger, if you spoke up, uh, maybe you were told not to speak up, it wasn't the right thing or you, whatever you asked for probably wasn't uh, you had no right to ask for it. Are there other things yeah. that play on that? Like that, that, um, I yeah, guess. absolutely. Um, the, the research all points to inconsistency. Um, and let me throw out a disclaimer really quick. I'm not, I'm not trash talking anyone's parents here, right? As a parent myself, we're all kind of just hopefully doing the best that we can as parents, but for anxious attachers, inconsistency, um, in the way that we perceive our needs as being met as children is um, is the ticket there. We would feel our parents' absences or rejections very strongly. We would also feel their attention and affection very strongly. Um, that hypersensitivity to what what we're feeling about whether or not our needs are getting met uh, is the that's where anxious attachment is kind of born. Um, I think uh, the research also also shows that um, there's some nature involved, not just nurture. I happen to be a very sensitive kind of anxious person who pays a lot of attention to the environment and those around me. And in that way, as a child and a baby, I would pay more attention to if my parents were were off in their own world or if they were if they were scolding me for something or disappointed or if I asked for something and they said no and I was felt like I was too much. Uh, to where my my sister, who's absolutely not the least bit anxious, not a super uh, sensitive individual. And I say that with love. She's just stuff like that kind of just rolls off her back and it and it didn't affect her as much. And we had the same parents. So there's a there's nature and nurture involved there before anyone calls their mom up right away and says, you did this to me. <laughs> there's um, so we we come. We come hardwired with uh, dispositions that contribute to that as well. I've also seen some literature that says that our early romantic experiences can stamp us in that way too. Yeah, your first love. But it, I always mm -hmm. say that our parents did the best they could with the information they had. Exactly. They've yeah. been programmed. I mean, these are just programs that have yes. been passed down. Right, mm -hmm. even genetically, they're being passed down from generation to generation, and depends yes. on your culture as well. True. Yep. That has a lot to do with it also. Mm -hmm. So in your There's research, so many factors. It's not yeah. just one thing. There's a lot going on. Yeah. So go, So as part of your research, what are some of the other things, like, let's say from a cultural perspective, what were your findings? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that can be a little tough. There are definitely cultures that kind of encourage more codependent relationships. Um, so somebody living in a culture that um, really glorifies sacrificing your needs for the collective good or the or the relationship would probably be less avoidant and independent um cultures such as i know i know here in the u.s uh we are fiercely independent and so the idea that somebody can take care of themselves and they don't need anyone is really glorified here um so I think also those attachment styles would probably be demonized a little bit in those opposite type of cultures. So um, uh, young children are probably encouraged to be more self-sacrificing in a collective type culture and more independent in a 
in a culture that, what am I trying to say? In a culture that uh, wants people to to be an island somewhat. Mm, I love it. So then as parents, so how mm-hmm. have you changed your parenting style understanding these attachment styles? Yeah, that's, wow, that's a really great question. And um, it's a lot. It's a lot. I, I think back to how I was parenting before I knew about any of this. And uh, yeah, that's not to say that I'm like an A plus perfect parent now. I'm certainly not. But I definitely think uh, when my son makes requests, I definitely think now, how how is this going to affect how he thinks about making requests? Or if he wants to be very independent on something and I tend to rush in and help him too quickly, I, I think, ah, don't help him. Don't make him feel like he can't take care of himself. Because I know that it's it's lots of those interactions with your parents are what shapes how you feel about relationships, whether or not he thinks he can take care of himself or whether or not he thinks of a relationship as someplace safe that he can go to get needs met. That will absolutely shape who he becomes as an adult. I'm actually really excited to see where he ends up falling <laughs> on the spectrum. I hope I hope that he's secure with what I've given him, but I know that a lot, so much goes into that. I can't bank on that just based on my interactions with him. <laughs> I, uh, my son's 28 and I was having a conversation with him uh, when I mm-hmm. was doing this research myself and he's definitely avoided attachment. Really? Well, I was a oh. single mom for 11 years. So, oh, like, okay. Yeah. I, you know, I had to do the best I could uh, at the time, sure. but when I researched this, I shared it with him and I said, now mm-hmm. that you know this information, um, it's gold because you're going to be different yes. with your children because this also, yes. these are programs. Because I'll say to him, like, that's not yours. That's my stuff. That's my program. <laughs> so I'm starting yeah. to become more aware of these programs that I've imposed on him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to that. My, my son's, uh, he's only 10, so he's definitely not out in the romantic world yet. But um, when he is, I'm going to share that with him too. I'll... Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's okay. The other thing I wanted to is for our listeners and our viewers, like what are some of the things that go through uh, an anxious attachment mind? What are some of those things like, well, he, Will she or he leave me? Will like what, what? What are some of those things that they go through? Yeah, let me think of some of the and these are the kind of things um, that if you stumble upon one of the tests online, the tests online are actually great because they're full of these questions like, do you relate to this statement? Do you relate to this statement? And some of those statements for the anxious attachers would sound like, well, the the hallmark one that I've mentioned a couple times already is, no one will come as close to me as I want them to. Um, let's see, I'll, I will be rejected if I ask for things. Um, oh, of course I want to come up with really good ones. I don't want to, let me think for me as an anxious attacher, um, the things that I want are not important to my partner. That would be, that would be something that they would think. Um, it doesn't matter if I ask for things, my partner won't care. That would be a an anxious attacher sentiment as well. Um, hmm. I, I feel like I want too much. That would be a statement that an anxious attacher would agree with. Um, I feel like if somebody saw the real me, they would reject me. That's a, that's one of them. I, I highly recommend hopping online and finding, um, the test over at yourpersonality.net is run by a psych department at University of Illinois, I think it is. And um, those questions are just amazing. But when you hear the questions, you know, like none of those questions probably set much off in you. But hearing like, hearing people want to get closer to me than I'm comfortable with, that would be the kind of thing that you would probably relate to as a more avoidant attacher. Um, I feel intruded upon when people need to know where I am and what I'm doing that kind of thing. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think about things that my partner would say (laughs) because he, he leans, he leans more avoidant for sure. Uh, um, Oh, yeah, absolutely. They do. Um, Yeah. That's a real one really sad part about attachment theory is that um, for the anxious attacher, um, 
we hold all those things that I just said as truth. And so if I'm sitting on a date across a table from somebody who's just really engaged, they love all my requests that I'm making, they have so many questions about me and my needs, that doesn't feel like love. Um, I found myself bored stiff on all of those kind of dates. Um, but if I'm sitting across the table from somebody who's mostly talking about themselves, they're very busy, it was hard to pin the date down, that confirms my worldview that I want too much, other people are too busy for me, I need to do something special to earn the love of this elusive creature who I can't pin down. Um, yeah, and and those those sparks and that, that insecurity and tension very much feels like romantic love to an anxious attacher. And I would actually have to pick your brain on what what makes sparks fly for an avoidant attacher because I have not done very much research into into what it feels like for an avoidant falling in love. Um, and it also depends on your level of avoidance. If you are mostly secure but just tend to have some avoidant tendencies, you might like sitting across the table from somebody who's very attentive. Um, and you know, but if you're very very avoidant. Um, I suppose somebody who's going to be very clingy or needy might feel safer to you than somebody who has lots of independence because mm -hmm. you think, okay, this person really needs me. They're not going to go anywhere. That's what I, that's what I would assume an avoidant attacher might think who is deeply mired in, in avoidant behavior. Yeah. I don't think I, I think, look, I honestly think we go through our moments i think that mm -hmm. i probably fluctuate secure and at times avoidance and then at times the, like the pattern i was talking about the more anxious yeah. my partner is the more avoidant i am it's it's kind of like Absolutely. when i become the observer i can really see it very clearly how it plays out and so it's mm -hmm. about having those conversations so now that you're in a different relationship and you're both mm -hmm. aware of it, are you both working at this consciously to be secure in your relationship as often yes. as possible. Yes, both of us are. And I have to say for the first year and a half of the relationship that I'm in now, he was not. It was just me deep in my books doing all this research, working on my own side of things. Um, but I became so calm and so happy and such a safe place for him to land uh, that eventually he came to me and he said, you're a different person than the one that I met and I want in. He was like, I don't know what you're doing, but I like it. And I want some of that for myself too. Whatever you're doing, let me know. Um, and now we absolutely are both, we're paying attention. I'm paying attention to when I'm being clingy or needy in ways that would push him. And he's paying attention to ways that he might be distant or a little bit cold. And we're both trying to do an about face and head the other way when we see ourselves in those behaviors. And it's, it's been wonderful. That's not to say that they, those behaviors don't still happen, but we know, we know how to recognize them. We know how to point them out for our partner when our partner recognizes it, when, when we don't. Um, yeah. And it's just, it's much better now. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting because I've always uh, said to my partner that um, because behaviors are unconscious, give me the feedback. Yeah. So I know when I'm doing it. And oh, it's I really like funny. He doesn't give me the feedback yet, but he'll go, are you okay today? Is there anything wrong? And I'm uh, like, here I go again. Am yeah. I doing it again? So <laughs> it's kind of feedback. Yeah. In a but that's, again, that's that whole standing in the truth, just saying, hey, you're doing it again. Right? That's yeah. there's that there's that resistance of saying you're doing it again, mm -hmm. just as simple as standing in your truth. Yeah. Oh, I have a visitor here. No, <laughs> I know. It's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> So what else did you find in your research? Because you got a whole book about it. I'd love to unpack a little bit about what's in your book. Oh, thanks. Um, I think um, the first part of my book uh, talks a lot just about anxious attachment and what it is, what the, what the driving ideas are behind it. Uh, the middle part of the book talks about actionable things that we can do as, of, as anxious attachers to move ourselves toward a place of more security. These are going to be they're actually kind of exactly what you would expect, getting yourself to a therapist, um, working on yourself uh, physically to get yourself into a place of better self-worth and self-esteem. Um, that's not to say that you have to look fantastic to have high self-esteem, 
but you do need to be somebody who who puts effort into yourself and focus on your on your health and well-being in order to raise that up um also building up your support system so putting more time and energy into friendships and family relationships um and then the last part of the book talks about actually getting back out into the dating world or or into like actively diving back into your relationship. The book's written more for the single person in mind, but um, a lot of my readers say that they're in a relationship and they get plenty out of it too. Um, But I talk about building up a relationship gradually instead of just diving right in regardless of who that person is or what they can bring to the table. And how do you do that? (laughs) And how do you do that? Well, that's... (laughs) I I have friends that have have uh, always deep dive in a relationship head first and then end up finding themselves like, what am I doing with this person? Yeah. Um, let me let me look it up really quick because I always forget the order of things. Um, one of the books that I recommend in my book, um, he is, his last name is Van Epp and it's his relationship attachment model. Um, it's fantastic, but it talks about thinking about a relationship as if, you're looking at um, the, the equalizing sliders on a soundboard and you're turning up the volume one by one. The very first slider um, that you want to turn up is, is, is labeled knowing. You want to get to know someone, which seems, you know, that seems like really exactly what you would think. But a lot of people don't do that. They'll dive right into commitment or they'll dive right into physical intimacy but he says, um, knowing is the first slider that you turn up. And once you feel like you've gotten to know someone sufficiently, you can move on to the next slider, which is trusting. If somebody shows that they they have um, great values and that they're dependable, you can start to trust that person. The next slider that, that you'll turn up the volume on would be relying. So we don't we don't put any reliance on somebody until we know them well and we feel like we can trust them. The next slider would be commitment. And and I know that I've certainly been guilty of the past of that being my very first slider. I'm committed to someone before I know anything about them. Um, And then he says, this is controversial. The very last one is physical touch. And man, that's tough. That is so tough. If you're on a date with somebody and they're super attractive and they're very charming, a lot of people want to dive right into that. But he's saying um, that you really have to pace your relationship in order to make sure that it's a safe place for you to put your time and energy. I totally agree with that. I think that mm-hmm. for me, I, I've, I'm very old school. I I have mm-hmm. to date with someone for a very long time before yeah. I'm uh, comfortable enough to uh, allow them into my life. Like I think that's yeah. why I stayed single for such a long time. It's just one mm-hmm. of those things. I'm, But then I'm quite happy by myself. Oh, exactly. Right. right. So, so it's not an like anxious I don't attacher. Need physical touch. Yeah. I don't need anything. I don't need anyone. Right. So maybe that maybe that um, model with the slider sounds very comfortable and it normal is. to yeah. you. I'm like, yeah, I'm like that. I'm, 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 yeah. I, but even then, <laughs> trust. Trust is one mm-hmm. that I know that, and I teach it. So I always say, if you, because mm-hmm. there's different types of trust. People trust anybody and everybody. Um, and that was me until proven wrong. Mm-hmm. Some people say you have to earn their trust or trust mm-hmm. needs to be earned. And then others don't trust anybody ever. So, sure. so there yeah. are different types of trust. So for me, trust is a big thing because I know that mm-hmm. if I don't trust someone, I'm putting it out there because like it's it's they're going to pick up what I'm putting down without me saying anything. They're going to pick up my vibes. Hey, I don't trust mm-hmm. you. So Mm -hmm. it's it's once again it's that whole work on, and I guess it's because of the the avoidance attachment style, right? For them to (laughs) trust people because so many things, you know, like you've been put with one person, put with another person, and you have to uh, fight for yourself. Um, I think Mm -hmm. that that's a big thing for, uh, I guess, avoidance. I can only speak for myself. Whereas anxious attachment, they tend to, but I think they lack trust as well. We lack self-trust. We lack self-trust. That's our problem. Um, okay. We, I don't know. I. It seems to me that anxious attachers, they, 
they're putting their trust in places that are very clearly not places they should put trust in, but they do. We do, I should say. Um, we, I love the, the swimming metaphor. Um, for anxious attachers, we can't swim on our own and other people are our life rafts floating along. So, so that's why I love that model so much because we need to see that they are someone reliable to grab onto before we do. Um, because our tendency would be to go, oh, there's someone they can swim. I'll just hold on to them. I love that. I, I, lo- I love the <laughs> fact that I love the analogy. I've not heard of that analogy, but when you, it's true. When you were yeah. presenting, I'm like, oh, that's so easy. But <laughs> then if I think about it, my, t- my avoidance attachment style is going to be comfortable with that kind of uh, style. Yeah. So is there anything else that you would like to share from the book or anything around some, uh, and we will uh, probably unpack that towards the end. Uh, Mm -hmm. We always love to uh, leave our audience with three shiny golden nuggets, but before we share your three shiny golden nuggets, is there anything else that you would like to share for those that are experiencing, because it is an experience, it's not who they are. um, Yeah. Attachment style. Yeah, I think um, maybe just, again, the idea that there is so, so much that we can do about this. Um, When I first discovered anxious attachment, there was this bullet list in um, Amir Levine's book, uh, Attached, which is like the, it's the most popular one on attachment theory. But there's this bullet list of like 25 bullet points on anxious attachment behaviors. And I hit every single one. And not even like in a small way, like in a big way. It was like they were describing my entire personality. And I am not like that anymore. At like, like I said, I'll have moments of, of anxiety in my relationship. I'll have moments where I'm being a little bit clingy, but I have so many tools now and different ways of thinking that um, it doesn't describe me at all. And so for people listening to this going, oh my gosh, that's me. I feel doomed. How am I, you know? You're, you're nowhere near doomed. And, and as you said, they're behaviors. They aren't personality disorders. And, um, and I, just, I just love that there's so much that we can do about this. I, I love talking to people about this stuff and, and, um, and kind of inspiring hope that love doesn't have to be like this for us. I love that. And I even love the fact that you shared your own personal story at the start where even though that you were both aware of this information you you mm-hmm. also came to the conclusion that um that your relationship had evolved and changed into something different yeah because sometimes yeah. I think you- too it's important mm-hmm. for our, our tribe to understand that because you don't want to stay in a relationship if it's if it's uh outgrown or it's it's yeah done in different ways yeah <clears throat> yeah absolutely my um my my 12 year marriage even though we could see what our problems were um we determined that we would be happier apart. That was a really painful, tough decision, but that happens. You know, sometimes, sometimes the relationship doesn't go the distance and it doesn't mean that it's a failure. It's just, we do have to be on the lookout for what we need and be willing to stand by that. And um, that's not to say that a struggling relationship's doomed either. The one that I'm in now was kind of tumultuous and awful in the beginning. <laughs> and uh, and I we're so happy now. So there's a lot that we can do to to fix things too. I think um it it definitely it takes a lot of bravery to be able to look critically at a relationship and say is this working for me and if not I need to step away. And it also takes a lot of bravery to take take a look at a struggling relationship and say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make this better. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think it also takes a lot of courage and uh, mm-hmm. accountability saying, you know what, it's yes. there's two of us playing out this, this relationship, right. And even yeah. to where like, once I was aware, I had to share it with my partner where, when I'm, I'm like, now not the way that I, I, I delivered it was not that I'm making up an excuse for my behavior. But yeah. I've understood, I have a, a better understanding because we ha- we show love in so many different ways. There's different love languages, right? And so yes, but when you first meet, right, when you first meet with someone, you're consciously aware. So you're consciously aware of how you dress, how you speak, mm-hmm. how you eat, how you, everything, right? You're just consciously aware. So it's, it's I always say that's your conscious relationship. But over time yeah. when we get comfortable, 
then that's yeah. when we become then this is when the the unconscious behaviors kick in and then you go mm-hmm. man i don't remember you doing that like 12 months ago <laughs> and you start noticing mm-hmm. these things that then you start saying to yourself well maybe there's something wrong with my relationship but there's nothing wrong with your relationship it's just that mm-hmm. you are no longer conscious mm-hmm. in your relationship you have become comfortable in the relationship and thus you'll have your unconscious behaviors that start you know bubbling up and playing out yeah yeah and when two people can have a conversation about that how their unconscious um thoughts and behaviors are affecting the other person that's where the magic happens um Mm -hmm. accountability and a team teamwork a team spirit um goes a long way 100 percent, 100 percent. so ricky I am. Uh, I would love to continue talking uh, about this topic. I'm sure there's a lot more that we can unpack, but I am also conscious of your time. So we are <laughs> going to go to your three shiny golden nuggets. So what are those three practical tips that you would like to leave for our audience today? Yeah, um, the first one would be if you notice yourself um, as someone who has anxious tendencies in a relationship, Uh, The very best thing that I ever did was practicing speaking up for the things that I wanted and needed. Um, That was so hard. Um, First, I had to learn to identify those things. That was hard, too. But once I figured out what I wanted, I started out by asking for small things, practicing that regularly. And then I worked my way up. That can help mitigate some of the terror of of asking for what we want. And it helps build a lot of little positive experiences that gives us some momentum and creates some trust. Um, Yeah. So finding your voice and practicing with it. That's my first golden nugget there. Um, The next one is, of course, to keep your relational work on your side of the street. Um, Attempts to change or manipulate your partner into doing the work when they're not ready are only going to backfire. Uh, The work that we do on ourselves has the power to change the whole atmosphere of the relationship. So if you're struggling in a relationship because you feel like you're the only one doing work, um, have a limit for that. You know, you don't want to be the only one doing work for seven years, but realize that this stuff takes time too. I was the only one doing work for about a year and a half before my partner noticed, wow, I love your calm. I love your energy. I want to start doing this work too. I like to say, um, don't don't try to change them, try to inspire them. And that can go a long way. Um, and the last one is to learn to be your own best advocate. Uh, anxious attachers suffer from a big lack of self-trust. So I always, I, I thought in the beginning um, of my divorce, I have to be my own superhero. Nobody's going to swoop in and save me. I have to do this myself. So too many of us are trying to outsource our happiness and self-worth. The work for the anxious attacher is to be our own best superhero and save ourselves. Uh, You can become an expert in how to make yourself happy and how to feel good about yourself. Uh, This also lifts tons of pressure off of your partner so that they can feel safer to come close and join you in a relationship. You don't want them to feel like they're the one in the water dragging along two people, you know? So learning to be our own best advocate, our own superhero, learning to swim for ourselves. um, It's a way that brings our partners closer without us having to ask them to do that. I love that. And I even like the fact that, um, because I can't tell how many people end up in Mm -hmm. relationships and try to change their partners. I'll say to them, it's impossible. Uh, You can't change somebody else. You can only change yourself. You can only change Mm -hmm. the way that you view them or see them or think about them. And thus, Mm -hmm. by you changing within, that's how you inspire the different, you know, the different actions. Yes. You can't change others. It's impossible. No. Nope, but you can change the atmosphere of your relationship. If yeah. you make if you make your presence a safe place for someone else to land, they might come sit down next to you and, and open up every once in a while. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean that to me goes back to when you're doing the deep work, your projection and your vibes are very different. It's more inviting, yes. right? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so very much. So Ricky, where's the best place for our tribe to find you? Where do you hang out the most? Oh, um, Anxious Hearts Guide on Instagram. Uh, I am there every single day. I try to post every day. So there's always something there. 
Um, I would guess that most of your listeners are in Australia. Yes. Oh no, we've got actually more no? in the US. No, we've got. Oh, that's fantastic. Here. Okay, yeah, great. Our, so our, for... our, we have more in the US, believe it or not. Yes. Wow, that's awesome. Well, any well, that's that's good news for them because if you're in the US, my website anxiousheartsguide.com is where you can find my paperback book. Um, if you're if you're listening and you're in Australia, um, direct message me on Instagram because I do ship to Australia, but you've got to get the paperback through me. My publisher does not ship internationally, but I do. I'll ship my book to anyone who wants it. Um, there are digital copies on Amazon. I recently just recorded uh, the audiobook version of my book, which was such an adventure. So if you want to hear yours truly reading all those words, uh, yeah, for the audiobook fans, it's there. Yeah, Instagram is probably the best place. I've been dipping my toe into TikTok a little bit, but I don't I don't love that one as much. Instagram's yeah. where you can find me. Anxious Thanks. Hearts Guide. Well, we'll have that in the show notes. Thank you, Ricky, so much for coming on the show and sharing your vulnerability with us too. I felt like you're really open and vulnerable, really easy to speak to. And uh, thank oh, you for welcome. sharing your time and your energy. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. This was a joy. Thank you.